Guys, welcome to Scaling Impact with Government Partnerships. I know it's Friday evening, it's five o'clock. It's a heavy topic to be discussing at this hour. So we'll try making it fun, interesting, and hopefully all of you will have some insights that you take back with you on this one. As I was thinking about the topic, I was thinking, my God, for an NGO and civil society organizations who are on the phone with me here can actually resonate that once you get your door into one government partnership, you know, you feel you were right, even if it's the first one. Uh, this is what your hard work has been for. Um, a lot of people go through different journeys, different struggles. So some people it happens more easily than the others. But, um, you know, it is the point of arrival. On a lighter note, at least for me, I know I've experienced this. Most donor proposals have this question. Have you worked with the government? Uh, well, you try finding answers. Or oh, the one time you shared the dais with the government official, via via you supported a policy document. And, uh, you know, that's your answer. But once you actually have this door in, honestly, confidently, you can write about it. So with that, I wanted to welcome everybody to this session because we have three visionaries, founders of dreams um, who've actually taken their programs, have been able to get access to governments in very, very different journeys. Some have had really long, arduous journeys, which you will hear, some strategic, and some incidental. So with that, um, to maximize your time in hearing those journeys, I will put the spotlight on Vishal. Vishal Talreja, most of you would have heard of Dream a Dream. I don't think it requires any introduction. Their work in life skills and education has been exemplary. In fact, most of us use Dream a Dream's metrics when we start working with um, life skills and education. Vishal, you've been working with, for 15 years with Dream a Dream. You largely worked outside the government system. You worked with private affordable schools. You worked with government schools, but sitting outside that system. I think in these last 15 years, you've worked probably with more than 200 schools, impacting more than 50,000 students on an annual basis. In 2018, you have your annual event called Change the Script. I happened to be there, and I was pleasantly surprised to see Atisti Amarlena, who's the advisor to Shri Manish Sosodia, Delhi Government Education Minister's um, team. And they were there, they attended in full participation. I think personally, um, knowing you and about your work, that was the turning point. Was that the Delhi Government invited you to work in Delhi Government to set up the happiness curriculum? And now you've also expanded to four other governments. What has been your key learnings and insights working with the Delhi Government? Thank you, Anshu. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here on this panel. Uh, thank you to Nudge Foundation and all the partners who have made this happen. Uh, government is a very interesting uh, partner to have. Um, for the first 15 years of our work, we didn't work with the government. Uh, we focused on more refining and doubling down our understanding of working with children and young people from difficult backgrounds, marginalized communities. Uh, strengthened our pedagogical approaches, strengthened our assessment systems. Basically, we were preparing to then go into uh, and work with government at scale. Uh, we had been trying to identify which government to work with for a few years, and the Delhi government seemed ideal because they were doing some pretty radical reforms in education, which is when we reached out to them and invited them to come and see our work and attend a conference. Uh, and that was in 2018, and uh, the Minister of Education in Delhi, Manish Sodia ji, had been thinking of bringing some pretty drastic changes in the quality of learning in Delhi government schools. And one of the big things he wanted to start was a program invested in the well-being of children. Uh, his own insight, having visited schools, was that um, children's relationship with teachers and the school system is that of fear and not that of joy and engagement, and he wanted to change that. He had been thinking about this and when they saw our work and experienced our conference, they realized that we had the pedagogical expertise to be able to do that and invited us to help them anchor, design and implement what has today become a happiness curriculum. Uh, the happiness curriculum uh, works in about 1024 government schools, reaches about 800,000 kids every single day uh, from kindergarten to grade eight. Uh, and some of our learnings with our experience with Delhi government 
Uh, one was that while the Minister of Education had the vision and uh, wanted to bring about this whole new curriculum shift, we had to work through the system, through the bureaucratic system, and understand and break into resistances there. And a key element of that was one is engaging all people, all bureaucrats across the Department of Education, across SCRT, and listening to them. One of the strengths of our pedagogical approach has always been about creating safe spaces, using empathy-based pedagogies and creating environments of listening. And we were able to do that across the department, which helped us build trust inside the department and also helped us build co-ownership inside the system. We very quickly realized even though the vision came from the minister, if it had to be executed well, we needed to create buy-in and ownership across the system. Um, and that happened through trust building. Uh, through actually investing in meeting these people, spending time with them, listening to their own challenges and resistances and what's not working for them. Uh, today we can see the uptake of the curriculum is over 80%. 80% of the schools uh, are actually using the curriculum very, very well and they're seeing results. Uh, we also realized the scale of it, you know, uh, 1,024 schools, we had, to, we had to be training about 18,000 teachers uh, to use the curriculum and the ministry gave us six weeks to design and get the curriculum ready for implementation. Uh, so the way we went about the design was of course the design had to be done by a group of teachers and school leaders from inside the system. What we did was we trained them on how to understand design processes, especially for children from marginalized communities actually understanding uh, the behavioral challenges that children face and how do you design intuitive curriculums. The design also had to be simple and intuitive that a teacher can read through it and understand, okay, this is what needs to be done uh, instead of waiting for training to happen. Uh, so it had to be training agnostic. This training would have been a long haul process. And we have, after that, since then, trained teachers. But in, at the launch, we needed a curriculum that was deeply intuitive. Uh, what was also important was building champions across the school systems. So identifying certain schools, school leaders uh, who were waiting for something like this to happen, waiting for a disruption, uh, a new innovation in curriculum design to come in. And they picked it up and they loved it and they ran with it. And a big piece of our work was helping showcase the early uptake of the curriculum, showcase champions within the system who were taking the curriculum and running with it, picking up stories from there. And what happened is then the fence sitters really got excited when, when we started sharing these stories and they wanted to be part of the, of the fun too. And, and then they started joining in and the uptake started increasing. I think one of our biggest learnings, and I'll, 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 I'll close with that, uh, has been that you know, the happiness curriculum is really a well-being and life skills curriculum. Uh, it doesn't look anything like a dream and dream curriculum, but it has core elements and pedagogical approaches of life skills, empathy uh, in it. Uh, so we had to design a curriculum that responded to what the government wanted, rather than trying to, trying to give them a curriculum that we had designed and that was working for us. But we had to so take a step back and use all the insights that we had about young people over the 15 years of work and translate them into a design that works for the government at scale. And what that did was that it created a sense of possibility inside the government system. So if you look at the school calendar, it has been sacrosanct for decades. Uh, nothing really substantial has shifted in the school calendar. But what we managed to do is actually bring in a whole new curriculum, a whole new idea, which is not subject matter, but more focused on well-being into the system. And when it started working, the teachers started uh, opening up and saying, hey, if this is possible, maybe I can start looking at what else is not needed in the outdated syllabus. What else can I introduce? Can I introduce more physical activity? Can I introduce more play-based pedagogies? So they have now started championing ideas and innovations that they're taking to the minister and saying, could we try this? And, and the government is listening. It created this whole sense of possibility and it created a mindset shift, which is what's created sustainability and institutionalization of this idea inside the government system. Uh, yeah, I'll probably stop there. There were a few more, but I'll probably stop here. But that's really interesting, Vishali. I think most of us say, hey, this is my program. It's been piloted. It works really well. 
this is what I will come with. So I think um, to me, one real big key highlight was the fact that you respond to what they wanted. It was okay for them to pick up elements, but actually build or co-create what they needed, what would work within their system. Uh, that's interesting. So this is one job. You work primarily in Karnataka. Now this is Delhi, but you're also scaling up to other governments. Four, and I think there are the three in the pipeline. Uh, what do you think would change? And um, I mean, so what do you think is the success? What is that one thing that the other government saw to open this up for you? And the other one is, what do you think would be different? Would you have to co-create every time? Uh, that's a great question, Anshu. Uh, so what did happen is, you know, at the end of one year of running the happiness curriculum, uh, the Delhi government uh, put together a happiness utsav, a happiness festival. And uh, Manish Sodia again, uh, such a brilliant uh, education minister, he invited education ministers of all states to participate in this happiness festival and come and see the work specifically of the happiness curriculum. Seven state governments responded and they came and visited the program. And four state governments went back and said they wanted to introduce a happiness curriculum in their own state. Um, and then they obviously you know, kind of referred them to us and some of the other partners who worked on the happiness curriculum. Um, so that's how we now have taken the happiness curriculum to four other states beyond Delhi. Uh, in each state, the approach has been actually different. Uh, two states have just taken the happiness curriculum that Delhi had, it's open source. And they said, okay, we will just translate it to our needs and start using it. Uh, one state decided to actually design their own ground up. So they brought about 10, 15 partners together. Uh, and then they divided the work between all of us. And we designed curriculum for each grade or a couple of grades and designed different teacher training programs. Uh, one state decided to kind of do it uh, a graded scale up. So started off in two districts and scaled it up to 10 and then they'll scale it up to all the districts. So each state has responded to it uh, differently. But what's exciting for us is to understand now that, uh, you know, what Dream Dream has been talking about for 20 years now, which is an investment in well-being and life skills of children, social emotional competencies, uh, is increasingly becoming mainstream conversation inside the government. Increasingly, governments are recognizing that uh, an, in, an early investment in well-being and life skills of children uh, helps accelerate the learning process much faster. Uh, so the gains that we have by an early investment in life skills and social emotional learning are much higher than trying to just do academic learning and hoping children will catch up. Uh, so the language has shifted. The conversation has come to the to front and center around life skills and well-being. And governments are listening and the governments are willing to uh, take in innovations that nonprofits have done. Uh, something that we've always said and believed in is that uh, nonprofits are really innovation engines and we should be looked at like that. But the scale really needs to come from inside the government because they've got the capital and the access. Uh, and that's what we were able to do. Uh, in addition, there are three other states who have uh, brought us in to specifically focus on teacher training professional development in service and pre-service teacher training and help them redesign that. Uh, so that's what we're working in uh, across seven states now. That's phenomenal. For people who may not come from the education sector, and to me, um, life skills, well-being, were newer concepts or happiness curriculum, do you quickly want to share with Vishal in one uh, few lines on what this really means and what's the impact of it on children? Yeah, sure, uh, Anshu. Uh, so, you know, if I use a basic definition from WHO, life skills is defined as uh, behaviors and abilities uh, that are adaptive and responsive that enable individuals to respond and deal with demands and challenges of daily living. Uh, they further define it as uh, problem solving, managing conflict, negotiation skills, self-awareness, empathy, a whole host of skills. Um, the way we see it is, uh, especially in the context of today's world, life skills play a dual role. One is they help children develop the skills that they need to respond and adapt to a fast changing, uncertain future. The, the current crisis is, if you look at the COVID crisis, 
uh, children's ability to understand, make meaning, respond, and adapt to this crisis would have been much better if education systems had invested in uh, their life skills and social emotional competencies. Uh, so one is that. The second is especially in the context of children growing up in, in uh, vulnerable communities or marginalized backgrounds. Um, we all know that in early years of growing up, zero to 10 years, when children experience adverse circumstances, uh, neglect, lack of food and nutrition, lack of emotional care, of being orphaned or abandoned, or in extreme cases, exposed to violence or abuse, it impacts their ability to achieve developmental milestones, impacts their ability to even achieve um, full development of the brain. And this shows up in behavioral challenges in classrooms and learning environments. And you see children who are extremely restless or aggressive or extremely quiet or unable to uh, engage in learning, children who at one day are responding to you and another day they're just running away. Uh, these are all uh, behavioral manifestations of the lack of developmental milestones. In life skills and an investment in the well-being of children helps children catch up to these developmental milestones and engage fully in learning. Uh, and what does really well-being mean? You know, when you create safe learning environments for children, uh, when, when you have teachers who are empathetic and compassionate, when, you're, when you have teachers who are authentic, who are listening, uh, with whom you build a relationship of trust, and there's joy and creativity in the learning environment. These are the elements that are core to well-being of children. And when we invest in this in school environments, the gains over the long term, not only in children's own ability to engage in learning, but also to thrive in the world and achieve success in the world, are massive. Thanks, Sushant. Actually, honestly, um, I think getting inroads into the government and the government being receptive is kudos to both sides because initially and for everybody who's gone the life skills way, even when they go to donors, they find it very difficult to raise money because it's not directly correlatable to educational learning outcomes. And it's very intangible, very difficult to measure confidence, security, etc. Right. So I think uh, just the fact that governments are adopting it, I think is um, futuristic. And I'm really, really happy that it's happening. And Vishal, thanks to people like you and other NGOs doing this work, which is transformative. So I will come back to you. Uh, moving on to a very interesting, um, honestly, unique, uh, I would honestly put it out there that it's unique, a very unique partnership with the government. Uh, Kalyan from Pan IIT Foundation is with us. Kalyan, I would love, you know, so I would love you when, you know, I pass the mic to you for you to share about, you know, what Pan IIT does. All of us know IITs, but Pan IIT is, Pan IIT Foundation is doing some very unique work. Samaj, society, people as we know, Sarkar, the government, Bazaar Markets, the three pillars, these are mostly seen as three parallel lines. You seem to have cracked this. Um, and more that I hear about your work and in discussion with you, I, I think it's uh, a model which needs a lot more deeper scrutiny. Today we'll scratch the surface. I would encourage the audience to be able to find time with you if this uh, fits into their mandate and come back to you and learn more. But by, so what Pan IID Foundation has been able to do very uniquely is to get the government to invest with Pan IID Foundation in converting unused assets, assets which they'd invested with lots of hope, which were today not being used, into meaningful spaces of skilling in line with what the market wants. And at significant scale, in the shortest possible time is what I would love to add. Uh, that's what I hear as feedback from everybody. They have, and this opens the door hence to a unique partnership model. For example, you managed to build one of India's largest public healthcare education system in a &M nursing with training capacity of thousand nurses per annum in all of one year. Is that correct? Absolutely. Great. So, you know, uh, Kalyan, if you just shortly into tell people about how Pan IID Foundation, what it came about, and more importantly, what made you think of this concept of the government co-investing with you and what is in it for them to co-invest? Okay. Thanks, Anshu. Uh, it's a very kind introduction. And uh, I also want to thank the Nudge team. They've been super, uh, you know, enthusiastic, wonderfully supportive and really done a fantastic job. Uh, so thanks to everybody. Uh, since you've given us strict instructions to make this session fun, so what I'm going to do 
is to kind of uh, you know start first uh, i think because there are three organizations i think uh, I, I mean there's a fun way to think about government relationships maybe we can draw parallel to our real life relationships right so if you see vishal's work that's more like a guru shishya kind of a model where he kind of preaches and the system absorbs it ours is actually i'll come to ours last so ruchit is more like genuinely like a mother baby kind of a relationship where he's actually passed on his baby to the government for adoption we are actually squarely in the middle we are a marriage literally if i had to compare it we are a marriage uh, in every sense of the word uh, so we are married to the government that way uh, so what i will do uh, is that uh, instead of what you are seeing on the screen which is not really very photogenic i'll quickly share my screen to show you something so that you guys have a better perspective of what we are doing uh, is the screen share working yes it is okay i will just jump into sorry i'll just jump into screen share uh, so that you know all of you can just uh, uh, kind of uh, get into what we are doing all right uh, so thanks for the introduction so i will just briefly before i jump into uh, what we are doing in healthcare let me just explain uh, what is the you know what is the entire pan it alumni foundation about but i think it's a great time he's a his quotes are timeless and of course uh, is one of the three idols uh, the other idol today i actually had an opportunity to listen to mr yunus uh, so you know only imparting education through crafts can india stand before the world is the pitch which uh, gandhi ji had given and what uh, at iit we we kind of the foundation we we really felt a bit uh, uh, worried about or not happy about is the fact that india actually has some of the best engineering iim best management public education systems but when it comes to vocational education our its are nowhere global or even below its is even worse so we have actually not put the same seriousness that gets into putting public education systems into vocational education so that's the fundamental motto of what pan it alumni foundation does we are ideally trying to bring the iit in spirit into vocational education exclusively for the underprivileged and that's the last piece i mentioned this is in form of a marriage with the government called a non profit joint venture okay uh, so these are the typical building blocks uh, if you take from the iit system one of the massive achievements they have is that they've had a track record of 75 years of placement 100% to everybody fairly better than market wages so we said similar principles have to flow into any system of scale that you want to build so we have a short placement we have 100% skill loan financing uh, interestingly i'll show you about how we do admissions through poverty uh, so that's the model which we have identified and for today's panel i think the important operating piece is this which is the non profit joint venture with the state okay so let's just uh, spend a minute thinking about it uh, what actually it has enabled us to do and this is the uh, for example this is the Uh, uh you know the uh, mandate of the entire what is called a special purpose vehicle so we have actually institutionalized a separate section 8 company we hold 60% the government holds 40% so please note the percentages very carefully we are uh, controlling and that's where the autonomy comes from 40% the government is absolutely involved so it's truly a marriage of uh, you know in, in in the sense as we know that the lady is always the boss so she is 60% and the male is 40% so it works so this is the general model and what it has enabled us to do is to actually set up a public vocational education system uh, for about 10000 training of 10000 candidates per annum okay so we have two to three buckets or verticals of what we do uh, one is what is called as kaushal colleges which is which does one to two year trade licensing training the others are uh, two to three month uh, residential gurukuls which are basically uh, you know quick uh, construction plumber job driver stuff like that and then we have 11th 12th integrated and this is the uh, expansion we have done in jharkhand alone that means we have actually wherever you see blue or green or any of those uh, stickies you are fundamentally there that means we have more or less uh, covered every district of jharkhand which is the systemic approach that we were always wanting to do incidentally we got awards from the state all of that but that's fine that's not for today so now let me explain uh, one simple way how we have managed to do this in say for example nursing and how uh, government partnership has enabled us to scale okay so this is uh, our nursing college fairly 
high quality, the simulator, etc., is what you will see in Singapore, wherever you want to see across the country, across the world. And uh, this is the kind of infrastructure we have set up in nursing. Before I come back to nursing, let me just show you uh, pictures, for example, for man manufacturing. Right? These are women in manufacturing. We have 3D prototyping, electronics workshops, CNC, uh, e-learning, all the latest. Uh, just think of this as the IIT for ITI kind of uh, this thing. And this is our catering uh, uh, setup, fairly MasterChef-like. Incidentally, the students run the Seva Cafe. So this is the kind of infrastructure we managed to do. And uh, we've got it in various districts. And these all buildings, land, etc., is all from the government. Obviously, none of that has been built uh, for this now. Okay. So just to give you a context of what you're mentioning about uh, healthcare, right? Um, just some stats, right? Uh, government nursing colleges in India, uh, a and is the two-year course. It's called the Auxiliary Nursing and Midwifery. They are fundamentally the frontline rural public healthcare nursing uh, cadre of the country, right? Uh, these are the folks who, will, who you will find in district hospitals, block hospitals, referral hospitals, uh, CHCs, PHCs. So they are your first line of defense and they actually are, especially in a COVID kind of situation, they are what are called as community nurses. Okay, they are different from the folks we encounter in uh, BSc nurses, for example, in Apollo, etc. Now, India in the last 75 years has built a capacity of only 8,728 nurses per annum training. That's it. That's the India scale from government nursing colleges. And there's one more important thing: these government nursing colleges are affiliated to public hospitals, so they actually end up becoming uh, uh, basically uh, nurses in residency who are serving in these hospitals at no cost to the hospital. That's how Ames runs. That's how John Hopkins runs. World over, all good medical institutions you must have heard of will have a medical school where the doctors come from, will have a nursing school where the nurses, all candidates in training in the last year of residency, they come and uh, they actually, they actually uh, you know, go and do this. So that's why it's uh, very useful that, uh, uh, you know, basically this is what a &M does. And in one year, Pan IIT has been able to do 1,000 nurses, close to 1,000 nurses per annum. And uh, that's because we have the non-profit joint venture with the state. So the state felt we were like an insider, not an outsider. That's why I gave the example of really coming together very closely. And uh, that's what happened. So then what we have done is that if you look at it, the top three rankers from the state has come. And the admissions into this is actually based on uh, poverty. Okay, so if you're poor, after clearing a cutoff, you get an admission. So for example, if I had to show you case study of uh, some girl, this is the typical family or household she comes from. And Geeta Gumari, for example, ended up becoming the state topper. Okay, so it, that's the kind of transformation that the state really values. And if you have, uh, the important thing in this is to have a model for uh, for having a copay, it cannot be that 100% the state pays. So what they've done is they've given us all the money to invest into infrastructure like this, what they would have otherwise spent in salaries and government posts and all that, which is very inefficient. Then we have actually got the students to take loans and uh, kind of come up with the uh, you know operational expenditure copay so that the state for the same money gets an extremely high quality uh, infrastructure and system that uh, you know beneficiaries are co-paying it's market aligned and it works so that's the key so that's what i think is a very good way of understanding and the point you made about bringing samaj sarkar bazaar is extremely valid we don't see them as three parallel lines uh, we are engineers i'm sorry we are boring so if i may use the analogy we are actually we believe they are a triangle they have to be the three sides of the triangle for any intervention to work they have to work together and in our case, for example, like I explained, the employer gets involved in the training. That's how industry and the market facing is there. Um, the government is giving all the hard infrastructure. And we as civil Samaj uh, are actually trying to give this benefit of this program to the most deserving and the poorest, but also not compromise on quality. So this is the best quality for the poorest kind of a mandate. And once this happens, the government is very happy because they get their social objective done because we are actually doing a uh, service to the poor and it's a very good vote bank, even politically speaking. So therefore, if they get the credit and they are happy to kind of uh, 
uh, do the udghatan and say we have done all of this good stuff just like iits for example government is very proud that they are in that system and they rightly so they have really worked hard for it they have co-contributed for it they deserve all the credit so if they can do that they have a political case the impact case is very clear and the economic case which many non profits seem to miss is also equally important so do not uh, think of having a 100% subsidy model you should have a model where government puts in some capital uh, there is a way to co-pay eventually it should be economically more uh, efficient than the status quo i hope this uh, gave some clarity so i'll stop sharing and uh, i will leave the control back to anshu thanks kalyan yeah i think this is um, i don't know how many people have experimented with such a model or have tried uh, working with the government i know for me the question burning question on this one is how much time did it take for you to conceptualize it take it to the government did you know which government to go to did you intuitively know jharkhand government because you had connections there inside there or um, iits hubs i don't know so just from time to conceptualization to it being bought that's question number 1 and how did you know whom to go to yeah so i think uh, that's where uh, you know uh, when i explain the triangle model one of the important pieces in that triangle model is the bazaar okay we should be letting the market guide us because market is very intelligent it's self correcting it's smart okay in our case the reason why we chose jharkhand you will be surprised is because they had the highest repayment among all the other states where we have experimented a skill loan model so actually that's because students are poorer they are much more hungrier to really uh, get use their opportunity instead of just getting trained and sitting at home so actually the market drove us to choose jharkhand and once we got in of course the state really helped us they have been very open uh, we've had some iit ias uh, uh, you know bureaucrats who came on board they have understood the sincerity see it takes time to earn trust of the government so that took in our case for example uh, about 3 to 4 years but once that is done and this is the first time ever you are doing right uh, therefore it takes that time but once you have done that once you they have seen your credentials you are not a fly by night operator and an important important thing many people have to keep in mind is that government is eventually safeguarding your and my money right the taxpayers money so for them it's massively important that this comes with a very clear intent of impact and not uh, some you know uh, side tracking and making money on the side or anything like that right? so for them you have to be out there and we've said we are iitians we've quit our jobs we are here for this so it's not some fly by night uh, you know we are just there to figure it out that's not the approach that they appreciate it and uh, like i said it's eventually the economic logic that really drove them if you see our uh, spv document why the government actually so what happens is there's a process called gazette notification okay every decision by cabinet has to be notified in the gazette and uh, in when when the cabinet uh, chose us without any uh, tendering kind of process the singular reason that was given is that we were the only player who did not take grants from the government as opex and actually came up with a skill loan model that the candidates can pay and is sustainable so the economic logic is at the heart of it so do not underestimate its importance then of course what happens is once you built it initially we started in couple of districts then more districts came just like what vishal was saying the other districts said then the state said if every district wants it why not just go lump sum and do it at the state level now we are talking to other states so the acceleration with the government is always fast but the start is slow you have to be patient you have to be um, persistent and most important like i said you also have to have really serious uh, innovation on cost or a uh, value reengineering so these three elements if you do uh, i think you will be in a good place just last on this before i circle back later is um, now you have co investment with government is decision making slow is it independent um <laughs> just out of curiosity it's like any work? other it's like in any other marriage setting so you will have a, a up and down no i'm not kidding so we have board meetings uh, where for example the additional chief secretary or the development commissioner of the state is uh, our co chairman and we have a chairman who is uh, mr you know in in this uh, jharkhand entity mr mutraman uh, who is actually a distinguished alumnus from iit madras padma bhushan awardee 
So now what happens when such a high powered board room sits is they genuinely deliberate it for the merit of the case. There will be some pulls and pressures. Uh, they will say, can you get some co-investment? Can you look at all of this? So obviously it will go through its uh, uh, you know, ups and downs, but the beauty is it works out for the state eventually. So we've seen that uh, it takes time. Uh, there hai and there nahi hai. So I think if you have that hope and long, uh, long enough time horizon, then I, 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 I can only say good things about what we've experienced so far. So it's really worked out. I don't think there's any conflict of interest. And that's the important thing. Like I said, your agenda and their agenda should be serving the poorest. If there is any diversity in that, then you get into trouble. I'm sure there's going to be lots of people who are going to queue up to talk to you. Absolutely um, happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, moving on to a very different experience. So education, skilling are still fairly discussed on the, um, I mean, th there are a lot more in the public eye conversations. Um, they have lesser downsides, if I can call it. Moving on to Ruchit of Kushi Devi. Of course, I like love the name itself. Uh, Kushit, uh, Ruchit, we will ask you why that name at some point. But, uh, you know, in my conversation with you, what really came across is that you truly have had a long, long, long painstaking journey in making inroads of the government on something which uh, people like you and me, we read newspaper articles, we would think it's such an obvious, right? If any technology ties into mother-child health will reduce infant mortality or, you know, this whole malnutrition, it should be a no-brainer, right? But it's been a long, arduous journey for you. Um, it was technology which was going to sit within the government system and uh, it's taken blood, sweat and toil and um, 2015 is when you started, right? With your testing and you started with 100 ANMs, which uh, Kalyan just explained what they are. And uh, now, finally, you have a breakthrough and you're going to be talking to working with 50,000 ASHA workers and ANMs across the entire state of Rajasthan. My key question, and we've learned the two different models for Vishal, it was, you know, proven pedagogy, established credibility, and, you know, government saw your work, bought into it. Panahiri started with wanting to work with the government, created an economic model, which is very different. For you, if you could share with people who want to get into healthcare, they want to integrate with the government, what are the critical facets from your experience that they must plan and prepare for? Yeah, so, so thank you. some of your pain and journey can be minimized when they start. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Anshu, for having yeah, me. Richard. And thanks to uh, Nudge team. This is a great event. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, like you mentioned, we're coming from the health, the public health, and the technology angle. And when we started, we started as outsiders. This was really a public health student run, volunteer run project where, you know, I was an undergrad at Yale. We had a design class. Part of the design class was to come up with some idea that you can take to the field. I got connected with my COO who was pursuing his PhD at the time at Indian Institute of Health Management Research in Jaipur. And uh, over the summer we met, we co-created, we had a chance to work with a small NGO, not a small NGO, but a actually quite well-established NGO known as Seva Mandir in Southern Rajasthan, um, who has actually been around for the last 50 years. They have a whole culture of trying new things out and experimenting. So they, they were open to taking our technology solution and allowing us to play pilot and uh, use their sandbox, if you will. So uh, that's kind of how we got our start. And coming from a research background, we are very much interested in both applying, you know, all the human-centered design principles and really getting our hands dirty in, in making this technology innovation culturally appropriate. And we also had this research angle. We wanted to make sure what we were doing actually was feasible from an implementation standpoint. And then later between 2016 and 2018, we wanted to see through a more rigorous randomized controlled trial, a more rigorous evaluation, if the whole collective system um, could actually deliver on particular health impact indicators like improving infant immunization rates, like decreasing infant malnutrition rates, like you mentioned. So after starting off with that relationship with the NGO, then we graduated on their reference to the local district. We met with the district CMHO, who was himself very visionary, but tested us 
He wanted to make sure that we were an NGO that was there to stay, that was really there to work with them. He actually pushed us to reinvent our whole technology platform to really um, cover all of the responsibilities of the a worker and the full spectrum of care that she delivers. So it took us about a year to really gain that trust and gain his confidence. But then once that confidence was, um, you know, sort of earned, uh, he then gave us the ability to perform a very large 3,000 mother randomized control trial across 600 villages, which then allowed us to get good quality evidence about whether or not our system worked. Um, and along that time period, we did iterate on the, on the, on the system itself, adding new, new features, ultimately not sure how, uh, to what extent we'd be able to define our quantifiable impact. But we were very lucky that by the end of 2018, we did have good results, significant results, um, and it made, made it feel like the whole kind of toil had finally paid off. But there was still a long way to go. Just because you have evidence to support your, your public health technology doesn't mean that um, it's, a, it's of any use to number one, the local district, because you're not saturating the entire geography, nor to the state. So then really the transition was, how do we take these learnings and start to really advocate at the state level where the policy level decisions are made and where you know, those policies then trickle down to every rural village, every a &M, every ASHA, who then implements that mandate. So then we kind of, um, you know, struck a bit of luck, I would say, a, a lot of luck. We had a lot of luck along our, our journey. Um, in that we uh, were able to reach out on a cold email and get connected um, to the current health secretary, the additional secretary of health, Rohit Kumar Singh, uh, who has his own background. Um, uh, being a, a Harvard alum, so there's some connection there. Former health, uh, former IT secretary, um, knowing about technology, working on the same technology actually that we've used when he was um, a member of the Highways uh, Commission for the Union Government, uh, which used EasyTag technology, which use, which is basically kind of a, another version of the technology that we are working, which is called near field communication. So embedded in that health card is a near field communication chip that you can tap in order to digitally exchange information. So that same type of technology is used in easy tags. So there was this kind of magical convergence of background technology and also he was thinking about the same types of problems that we were thinking about. How do we give everyone a health record? How do we integrate many different siloed health systems? And you know, our pitch immediately spoke to kind of the direction that he was interested in. So that, that was very lucky, but that was just the starting point because even if you have, you know, um, even if you have his buy-in, you really need to have the entire uh, department's buy-in for this to really work. The department is the one that's going to take this platform forward. So over the last year, our, our work has really been focused on how do we really meet with every program director, every state nodal officer, um, and inculcate this culture of trying to push the, you know, platform and technology forward. Uh, in a place like public health, you know, you have lots of legacy systems that have been around for 10 plus years, lots of experience, and in, in, in turn, a lot of inertia for new innovations that come out for change. Ultimately, um, we had to then, you know, go through not a tendering process, but it was a competitive process for our platform to ultimately be success, uh, to be selected for scale up in which there were other established developmental uh, partners in play, other incumbent government uh, platforms and technology teams in play, a lot of internal politics, vested interests you can imagine. Um, in order for us to get selected, we also had to, in a way, uh, be ready to really um, put all of our skin in the game. You know, we have a, we grew from a 25 member to a 40 member team this last year and we basically said, look, this platform is going to be owned by the government. We are going to give everything to the government. We are not going to be taking any payment for, for, for this platform, even though we've invested five years um, of our own money from, and that we've raised from grants. Really, it's going to be full ownership for the government. Um, and our team is going to be there to support them for the next three years. Uh, so that was the, the model that we gave where we were completely putting ourselves on the line, saying that our ultimate goal as a nonprofit is to see a platform, if it does have value, which we believe it does, 
uh, ultimately scale and the vehicle for scale is the government. So if the government wants to adopt it, let it adopt it, let it be empowered to adopt it. And in turn, we can see the impact that we initially desired. So that was our approach. And we're very lucky that um, as of actually last week, we had a, our three-year contract signed uh, with the Rajasthan uh, Department of Health. So uh, we are now kind of fully hands-on for the next three years and really excited to see now this platform scaled across the state. That's amazing. So how does this feel? And I think Ayan touched upon it when he was trying to say how he sees the different models. This is about child, but this is your child you're handing over. How does that feel? I mean, you know, it's your technology. You've developed it with a vision mission. Ownership is completely moving. How does that feel? Yeah, so I think um, we made a deliberate decision when we started this whole thing to be a nonprofit and not try to think about, hey, how are you going to protect the IP and this and that. Really, this was intended to be something that could bring impact at the end of the day. So it made that process a lot easier. Um, second, I think that during this three-year relationship and even this past year, the goal will be to closely co-create with the, with the government to make them feel empowered um, and to ultimately make them take ownership. So not just rebranding the platform, uh, in this case, it is being rebranded, of course, um, but, but really to make them uh, feel like, hey, this is something that they've put their hard work into. We, of course, have already put a lot of hard work into it. And when you have two parties that deeply invest in it and they can see the benefits of that, that's where I think um, it can be sustainable in the long run. And then we've also been thinking, you know, looking at the legacy systems. For example, Rajasthan has a system that's been around for 10 years called the Pregnant Woman and Child Tracking System, which is this uh, online portal to track 15 lakh pregnancies every year across the state. Um, and it's uh, something that's fed into by uh, you know, 17,000 ENMs across the state. And that was designed back in 2009. So it survived multiple different government changes and you know, it's still sustained ultimately. And now we are in a way enhancing and transforming that, that system. So our, our vision was that you know, it's hard to get into this machinery, but once you do get into the machinery, once your gear is in, um, then you're part of the system. And then you know, there's a long likelihood that it can be sustained. That's amazing. Um, really, really interesting. Do you have any one story you would want to share with the people because you worked across 20 program directors who had their own vision mission, there was inertia, like you mentioned. Any fun story that you have, any anecdote that you can recount which stayed with you? I mean, I think uh, before this year, we haven't really closely worked with the state government. So there was a lot of learning. And uh, I think some of the key learnings that I personally felt and definitely our team has felt is that you really need to uh, have thick skin and be ready for the constructive criticism. I mean, we've had multiple pre-COVID meetings with uh, it, like across the department and even Department of IT, Department of Health. Um, it is a it is a process and um, you have to be ready to really face uh, many different uh, you know, suggestions, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, but in doing so, part of the strategy that we employed was, uh, you know, if you have a large enough team, you can actually distribute your team and try to make those more individual um, connections. You can give a sort of requirement docs in advance of these larger meetings. Um, so that way the buy-in is on paper and it's well documented. So that's kind of the way that we've approached it. And, uh, you know, I, we're very lucky to kind of get to where we are now. I think the other thing, um, one other thing, I mean, when considering, it seems obvious you mentioned that, hey, this is for maternal, maternal and child health. And, you know, like it should be an obvious kind of thing that the government is wanting to take. We've also come to really appreciate the fact that the government is really focused on doing its programs well. Um, it's really focused on, you know, you know, directing attention towards those programs that have clear funding, a clear mandate, and that they have to execute on already. So new innovations have to actually go through that formal procedure so that way it can come onto their radar. Uh, and in the making the case for that, you also need to look at different angles, which I think was mentioned by Kalyan and others. So we also had to, for example, not just talk about the health impact indicators angle, which seems uh, to be a clear a thing for the government, but also there's an angle that hey, through our platform, we are increasing a level of accountability. And there's in Rajasthan 400 crores worth of direct benefit transfers that are going 
on the basis of uh, beneficiaries meet, meeting certain health milestones and on the basis of health workers performing certain duties. So if our platform is helping even stop 10% of the leakages, it pays for itself in terms of the overall program costs. We had to look in a detailed manner through the state budget to understand under what head could they possibly finance the technology costs. And that's actually the way that we've tried to get this thing uh, financed. So the government is ultimately financing the technology, the hardware, the software recurring costs, but they're not paying us because otherwise we would have to go under this vendor RFP type agreement, which we don't want. Um, we are trying to cover our costs through external funding using their stamp of approval and their scale um, to kind of approach donors. This is uh, amazing. I, I know I had to stop much earlier to be able to allow for more Q&A, but uh, we do have some questions. I will try taking some of them. The rest, uh, we will be happy to make individual connections. Uh, but before we go on to questions, I think for me, just summing up um, there very clearly what I've heard is ownership, trust, creating champions, respond to what the government wants, co-create, 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 accountability, impact, let them feel it's their baby. Then they will ensure its longevity and continuity. Um, trust, confidence. So, but keeping what the government wants at the center of this and allowing them to play, toy, give feedback, listen, absorb, co-create. So I think, um, these are a lot of learnings right there. Uh, so I think it's just been a terrific, uh, insightful session uh, thus far itself. Of course, uh, Ruchiti also mentioned getting lucky. Uh, luck plays a role everywhere. So yeah, uh, this is uh, awesome. So just moving, jumping quickly onto questions. Um, Varun asked a question, when you're proposing a policy change, I mean, what, how do you, especially if you're working on different themes or difficult themes, what are the key steps to creating, making a policy change? And uh, relevant question to that uh, follow on question was relevance of players in the same space. Can one of you take this in the interest of time? We have about six minutes. So drivers to policy change. So I don't know, should Vishal or Ruchit or Shrey, whoever. Okay, so I'll just quickly jump in, yeah. So uh, see the drivers to policy change, uh, we need to understand government a uh, little more deeply when we say that we need to suggest to them policy. They have at their disposal a whole lot of people, right? And on a daily basis, the secretaries keep getting uh, visitors and, you know, uh, interested parties. So we need to actually give extraordinarily contextual policy uh, recommendations. And for that, you need to have some on the ground track record. Which, is, uh, which comes from bottom up rather than, because the top down ones they have done, they've seen enough. Niti Aayog onwards, there are a whole lot of consultants who keep giving them lots of good, bad, sometimes not workable advice. But the point is they will really value insights that come from the ground up. You know? So that is, for example, we gave a very interesting, this thing, uh, in, in, in it, it just taking the nursing example further, I'm just using that as a theme. We have construction, we have a whole lot of other stuff we do. But, you know, the girls were very keen that uh, A&M nurses after, uh, you know, working for so many years should be able to pursue BSc nursing, right? So they said, why not make this modular? Why can't it be credits? Why can't we actually, uh, you know, uh, do this and then go back to education? And they genuinely had passion and money to pay for degree. So why not, right? So these are the kind of suggestions they will see it, they'll take it seriously. So it works, but it has to come from serious amount of on the ground uh, uh, feedback rather than just uh, theoretical uh, academic uh, intellectual stimulation. Fair. Anybody else wants to add? If you can add a sure. point here. Sure. Uh, we haven't actually worked on policy change at the state or the central level. Uh, our own take has been that uh, uh, policies don't bring about changes, uh, mindset shift does what we need to focus on creating a mindset shift across the ecosystem. Um, and when mindset shift happens, then it supports policy change. Here's an example is if you take the Right to Education Act, uh, as a policy, it's there, it's worked in some parts, it's not worked in other parts. It is not necessarily created a mindset shift around uh, education. It's not created a mindset shift that every child across the country, irrespective of backgrounds, 
deserves to have a high quality education. Uh, we still don't have that. Uh, so my invitation would be that while policy change is great, focus on mindset change. Uh, Vishal, actually, there was a specific question for you as well on how have you, uh, I'd made a point of reference that it's very difficult to measure um, the work that you do. And the question is, have you tackled the outcomes measurement with the government or with donors? So if you want to quickly talk uh, through that. Uh, sure. Uh, so one of the things we did very early on was uh, designed a life skills assessment scale, working with clinical psychologists, which is today a standardized peer review published scale used by multiple organizations. It's open source. Uh, this scale helps us measure improvements in life skills, especially for children growing up in marginalized communities. Uh, it's available on our website or we can share it with you. Specifically with the Delhi government and the happiness curriculum, the good news was in the first year, the uh, government said, we do not want to measure it. We do not want to measure the impact of the curriculum. We don't want our teachers to be burdened by an evaluation of this program. We want teachers to really take it up and enjoy it. Uh, and now in the second year, we have partnered with the Brookings Institution to do a third party evaluation of the happiness curriculum, which also includes developing tools that helps us measure changes in student behavior and teacher behavior uh, with the implementation of the happiness curriculum. And right now we are focusing on developing these tools and once they get standardized, they can be used across all geographies where the happiness curriculum is being delivered. So uh, to close the point, it is definitely possible to measure and assess life skills, social emotional learning, uh, but we need to look at assessments not as standardized testing, which is the traditional mode, but more as formative assessments which helps us understand where each child is at and what journey they need to take to move to the next level. Great. Um, there's one last question, uh, Kalyan, for you. Which sectors and areas in Jharkhand do you see a massive poten potential to expand your capacity building, ensuring economic logic and serious innovation? So we're looking at uh, agriculture. In fact, uh, I've just given a proposal on how do you build uh, village industry level producer organizations. Okay, so I think agro value addition, livelihoods in a completely different way, which is market linked, assured credit. There's a huge lot of work on uh, this kind of value added uh, entrepreneurship. So that's definitely one area. Second, I think uh, the construction sector, the other traditional industrial sectors are still in Jharkhand and informative. Mining, for example, we are setting up a uh, we are at least planning to set up a mining ITI. It's ironical that the state doesn't have one. So I think these are all different areas of work. Uh, there's enough work, I think, for the next five, ten years. So there's no worry. Of, there's no shortage of problems. Yeah, that, that is true. I think it just lacks our imagination. So thank you so much. Um, I'm cognizant of the fact that it's 5.57 and uh, we need to shut the session. I think I personally truly um, keep grappling with this. Unlimited India works with 200 social entrepreneurs scaling with the government is always a topic which comes what's the right time when to start um, so what I've heard is there's no right time to start you can start when you have an idea you have a time you can start when you have a proven technology developed or you can time when you have your own credibility established it is just your persistence that will take you through your honesty persistence and alignment with the government objectives so with that I really want to thank Kalyan Vishal you were amazing panelists, deeply insightful. I would encourage people to reach out to them directly for further questions and uh, would want to thank the Nudge team for organizing something so phenomenal. I'm saying in COVID times, we almost thought all engagement avenues will shut, but seeing the attendance and participation through the three days, I think this is a very, very bold step and it's done very, very well. So thank you. Thank you uh, to everybody in the Nudge team. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you, Anshu, and thank you. Thank you, Vishal Kalyan, Richard. Thanks for coming on board.